Hello, everybody. My name is Sophia Porter. My name is Carly Hill. This is You Got Got. A Game of Thrones podcast. It is Monday. It is the day after the episode, The Red Woman, the premiere of season six has come out. And I'm still really reveling in it. In it. I, I had a really good time watching it the, the second time I watched it. The first time I didn't like it as much. And Carly, you and I were together for it. Yes. <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. it, we would have it no other way, of no. course. <laughs> no, but uh, I, you know, I we were together. We had the wine, actually the beer flowing, and the yeah. ale. We had the ale flowing, and, and we had a really nice time watching it with a, a few friends, and, uh, you know, we just held hands through the whole thing, which was yeah. me hurting your hand more than <laughs> you holding my hand. It was I more of a... Point, I was gripping your hand, and I was like, I hope I'm not bothering her, and then I realized, I think we're squeezing each other's hand at the same level so much that it's canceling... It, we were numbing each other's hands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would definitely agree with that. Uh, so I think I think we should honestly just dive right into uh, the Red Woman because there's there's a lot to talk about. And instead of doing a full recap, we touch on like last season we touched on every single character and made sure we knew where everybody was headed. But the fact is, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know what's going on in Game of Thrones, unless you're just like listening to our voices. But like. I mean, I understand. That's understandable, but at the same time, I have a feeling every listener here is caught up, at least, yes. right? We, I, I think that's safe. I think it's, a, I think it's a pretty safe bet. So this instead, is... um, we're gonna do highlights and not so highlights of, yeah, of like the episodes, because that's we picked out. So Carly and I each picked out three, <coughs> two or three things. Oh gosh, I have a tickle in my throat. Uh, two, two or three things that we really liked about the episode, two or three things we didn't really like about the episode, and we're going to pick those apart. And I'm sure we're going to touch on everything at one point or another, but just for now, two or three things that we liked. The highlights section, the highlights reel, if you will. I like that. Yeah, like just, these are a few of my favorite things, and that was <laughs> bad. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> That was literally amazing. Um, okay, so I, I, I definitely think we should just, let's talk about the highlights. Carly. Let's do it. Did you have a, a, a number one, or should we count it from, like, will the, do they have an order, or should we just sort of just say what we liked? I think, I think let's just go for it. I, think I agree. Take it, take it, more, take it off. So, I'm going to do it. Okay, it's yeah, happening. Take it off. So, Why did it, <laughs> what is, take, take us off Sophia. is what I meant to say. Sophia, I'm not even there with you. <laughs> It's true, you're not. Ugh, we have computers and many miles separating us. I know. It's like, we're an entire, like, probably 15 to 20 minutes away, and that is too much. It's way too much. It's way too much. <laughs> it should be 15 seconds away at the very most. Like, tra- transporting. We need, like, a... I don't know. We need to learn how to operate. That's really yeah. what it is. I think that's the easiest way. Solely for this. Solely for you got <laughs> you got got recording sessions. When they give us the Nobel Prize, like the science the, the, the Nobel I have no the way. science prize oh. <laughs> for for figuring that out. We'll be like, well, it was all because we needed to record this podcast together. Uh, yes, we figured we out. About sci- we know nothing about science. We know science. nothing about science. It was magic. It was magic. It was that's the it. magic of Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay, so uh what was yes, okay. what's what's your first favorite moment of oh. the Red Woman? So, um, this is, this is a weird favorite moment, but I, and I, at first I wasn't sure if I enjoyed it, but I think I did. Mm -hmm. Um, the little call humor that was happening. Dude, I literally have that written down. Yes, oh my, see, I, I was like wondering where you stood on that, because like, part of me was kind of like, why are you making us laugh? This is Game of Thrones. These should not be happy tears. Exactly. Sadness. But I thought that was hilarious. Like, it kind of, I don't know, it was a good moment. I had a good time. No, I I totally 100% agree with that. I I wrote that down. I actually said, if you say this one thing, I'll say this instead. Because (laughs) it was, I had like a few favorite moments. I didn't, I didn't want to pick just three, but I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, But I I totally agree. I thought that call humor, it was so good. It was in a different language. It's in Dothraki, which we haven't heard in a long time. We know that Daenerys knows, so we're sort of on her side with it. But also, it's definitely humanizing these characters characters in a way that we've never seen the Dothraki humanized except for to call Drogo really yeah, before so and and so I, I loved that and also it's sort of like man we needed that I yeah I know I completely agree um and what you said about it kind of like actually fleshing out like their I mean 
kind of just their people as a whole. Like it was, it was nice to like get that little bit of humor and like have them be more than just like these are the Dothraki. They're a really good plot device in the first right. season. Right. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was so nice to return to that because I don't know. It. I will say another one of my favorite moments leading right into it was when Danny saved her. You know the whole. I I know what you're saying. Like <laughs> I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. She just saved that right until the right moment. She and totally first, did. I kind of like how it wasn't. Like, when she did break out the Dothraki, when she first did, like, they kind of laughed. They were like, oh, oh. Like, you're not, you're no, you're no one. You don't really matter. Yeah, you don't really matter. Like, we don't care if you can speak her language. They didn't do, like, oh, my God, she's speaking her language. Right, they didn't recoil in fear or anything. It was very, like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, it was like, oh, it's good. That was cute. That's funny. (laughs) It's a funny thing that you just said. No, I, so I completely agree. I think that whole, honestly, Besides one scene that we're absolutely going to talk about, that might have been the best character introduction and just put together scene of this episode as a whole. Because the audience needs relief. Yes. Whether or not we know it, like we go in, and that's why I like this episode so much more in the second viewing. The first viewing, I was really prepared for like action and everything to just sort of work out and that I realized that that's not the right way to look at Game of Thrones it's all about the game right it's called Game of Thrones yeah not the not the war it's not the the war of the the five kings it's not like it's not the war of the seven kingdoms it's Game of Thrones so it's all about the words and the verbiage and so I really appreciate that they gave a lot of thought into that and a lot of thought into that into this episode like and you can tell. Yeah. So it might not have been a most exciting episode. I mean, there were deaths, sure, but it's not Game of Thrones without deaths and, and boobs, <laughs> you know? We, yeah. But we, And there were both of those things. And we did have a death count. We did um, have a death count. Which I think should be a thing, actually. I Just, absolutely agree. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Totally. Within, what, three, uh, 30 minutes, literally 15 people had died already? Uh, yeah. yeah, about. Because uh, that's how Brienne killed some people. <laughs> so many people died. <laughs> Sans Snakes killed some people. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I really, I really appreciate this episode now. So yeah. and that was one of the exact reasons. So um, moving on, do you want to just say your third, and then we can go through yeah. mine? Great. Um, you know, okay. I I liked what they did with Arya in this episode because, okay. and you were with me like when I was kind of like what like because I I knew it was I knew it was supposed to be teaching her a lesson, but at the same time it was like. Their, their teaching methods are not great. Like, right. I'm just going to say, not the best, but whatever. <laughs> so, but I mean, I don't know. I, really, I like that. I like that they showed, you know, they're not, they, they're giving a reason behind her blindness. They're, they're kind of saying, okay, like you're blind. Now what are you going to do about it? And yeah. it's going to really kind of, I think it's going to push her character the rest of the way that she needs to go to really kind of come into her own power. I agree. And, I, yeah. It's yeah. it's sort of laying the groundwork for this character that Arya's finally on the road to becoming. I mean, she's been doing so much in terms of character development and changing. And and I, I said last season, you know, I compared the Arya's training in the books to Arya's training in the show. And in, in the books, her being blind isn't, it's not a punishment. It's, it's a way of showing her that she can use, she has to hone in her other senses before she can ever go out into the world because she relies so much on looking and on sight. And so it's really interesting that they chose to make it a punishment, but this Arya is different than the Arya in the books. She's way harder, and so I think it's perfect for, for her to be punished and for her to have to go through all of these getting beaten up in front of a bunch of people every day. I think it's really, it's interesting. It is interesting. I don't, it's, it's also interesting because I don't know that I viewed her blindness and what happened in this episode as a punishment per se, Mm -hmm. um, because compared to the books, like, and again, like still halfway through that first book, by the way, it's only (laughs) been 80 years. That's fine. Um, (laughs) chugging away. Oh Um, my God. (laughs) It'd be a while. Um, I'm going to get there. But, um, yeah, I mean, like I, I can't, I can't speak of, I can't speak to her character from the book. Um, because I don't really know her character from later books and, you know, when she is uh, in this process. But um, as a TV viewer, I kind of view, like, what they're doing What they're doing to her looks very much like a punishment, but it always has been, like, a teaching method. Yeah. A really, really harsh teaching method yeah. that I would not ever do. I, that This is not... If I was in Westeros at all, I, this is not where I would be. <laughs> right, exactly. No, I, 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 but Arya definitely sees it as a punishment. You know, okay. she doesn't see that this is a, a lesson yet. And, and, and I'm excited for when she right. actually comes to understand that this is something, 
she has to do in order to become no one and in order to sort of further her her claim on being this no nobody. I see what you mean. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I agree. Yes. Yeah, but I, I, 100%, I loved the fight. Honestly, the second time I watched it, I was like, man, the Waif is actually turning into one of my favorite characters yeah. because the Waif isn't, might not be the Waif. The Waif yeah, is, that's, oh my she's God, no yeah. one. That They've literally encapsulated the perfection of the House of Black and White. The Waif is not the Waif. The Waif is no one. It could yeah. be Jack. They proved that at the end of the last episode, at the end of the uh, uh, season five finale, they proved that. That was still, like, mind-twisting, yeah. like, oh. Yeah, so I, I totally agree. I think Arya, oh, I'm so excited. I say, I use that word so much. I was listening to our uh, uh, last week's episode, and I say, I'm so excited so much. <laughs> and it's because I am. <laughs> There's Just nothing good. else to say about it except for that I love everything about this. <laughs> so I'm just so excited. The day um, that there is, like, something that you don't say you're excited about in Game of Thrones, like, at least one thing, that's the day that I'm worried, that I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, she is no one, like, she is just wearing Sophia's face, I don't know who this is. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. Um, okay, so, uh, my favorite, so, it's nice, you and I didn't overlap at all, actually, so, um... Yes. Obviously, my my first favorite moment was Davos finding John's body, not not because it, John's body is found, but because it's Davos that finds him, and I think that that's such an important. Uh, it's it's really telling that they have anybody they could have had anybody find John's body, anybody in the Night's Watch, and yeah. they chose Davos, which really means that they're pushing him to become this better character, this better man, and they care about him. And you can tell. And that was something I really appreciated in this episode is how much Davos was cared for. And we're going to talk about that a lot more in Davos yes. talk, but it was it, <laughs> it started talk. off the episode in such a good way for me seeing Davos run to John's body. That that just that set the stage 100%. Yeah. So that, I mean that's a little there was already that uh you know connection between you know uh Davos and and the uh the red woman and and Stannis, like, when they, had, you know, first come to Castle Black, but I think that this solidified a better part of that, of what they, like, kind of weird relationship they were trying to build last season, yeah. um, and I, I agree with you, like, I didn't really, I didn't really pick up on the significance of Davos finding Jon's body, but you're totally right, I mean, that was, they would not have had him be the one to find it if they didn't want to, you know, expand on that and yeah. make that into something really significant. Yeah, it could have been Ed, it could have been Ghost, it could have been anybody that found John, and, and instead it was Davos. It's very poignant, and it's very important, and I'm, whew, I, I, it, it's, we're gonna get to it in Davos talk, I promise. That's what, like, I, it's all I want. <laughs> um, so, my next favorite scene, I want to make sure I don't, like, step on any of your toes. Uh, I think my next favorite scene has got to be, um, and I know you're going to talk about this later, but the Bran giving Sansa her sword just, uh, it it made my heart just sort of explode a little bit. Like, it's been so long, and, and Brienne has gone through so much, and Sansa has gone through so much, and they finally found each other, and she, they're not men. Yeah. And it's incredible. There are men there, of course. But they're not men, and they finally, it feels like Sansa's finally safe. And it terrifies me a little bit, because if Sansa feels safe, they can always take it away. And they've done that for season after season after season, they have taken Sansa's safety away. And so I'm really hoping that they're gonna not take Brienne away, because I think Blair would at least uh, (laughs) storm HBO headquarters. Oh, yes. At least, and I would probably go with her, because of all the people to kill Stannis, Brienne is the one I'm okay with. And, yeah. and of all the people to be with Sansa and to protect her, that was the perfect moment for her to show up. And, oh, yeah. But when they're, the moment of the two of them saying their vows to each other, that was by far and large the best moment of the show. That was incredible. Yeah. That was so great because it really was a buildup. And it, it was one of those things where I actually, for a few seconds, was like, if Sansa turns this down, because, like, you never, I mean. You never know. know. Yeah. You never really know with her. Like, um. She did it, she's done it, what, twice before? Mm-hmm. Or maybe just once, once before, but, yeah. Oh, just once, okay. But, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm very, very happy to finally see them together. Yeah. I also really liked um, when uh, she and Theon hugged each other. Mm-hmm. There was such a look of, like, not just safety in her eyes, but, like, just that familiar, you know, oh, my God, this this is family. Like, they're, Right, it, he it, actually, it's, it's he's not going to hurt family. me. 
Yeah, he's not going to hurt me in that way. He's not going to hurt me in that way. Yeah, yeah. and she Definitely. just looked so relieved. And, it, you know, it, it was the scene where he's, like, trying to warm her up, too, but she just looks relieved there. It looks absolutely. like the first real breath of, of air she's taken in a really long time. Yeah, uh, and and it was per- and it's perfectly ruined by those dogs, and then it's perfectly... Uh, that scene was... Oh, it was so good. It was so good. So that was definitely one of my highlights. And then my third highlight, and this is weird for me, was actually the conversation between Cersei and Jamie. Uh, when Cersei talks about how when Marcella was born, she was good and she was pure and she was everything that Cersei and Jamie weren't. And if she, and Cersei believed that if she could make something so good, she might not be a monster. And those lines just rang so true to me because it, it, so just like so open and honest and you've never seen Cersei. Like she really, when she sees Marcella's body, and John and John Jamie, <laughs> oh, Freudian slip there. Uh, uh, and Jamie riding on the boat toward her, like she, you know, she's hit rock bottom. Everything she's gone to up until this point does not matter because she thinks she's going to see her daughter again. And right. now this this is a turning point for Cersei. But the way that she said that, oh, it's just it really oh, it's so well acted. Lena Headey, man, she just gets me every time, and I. I have to say, like, those comments, that they were so small. Like, the way she said it made her seem so small. And I'm ready for her to become large again. And I think she's going yes. to this season. Oh, I think, she's, I think she's very much going to this season. I think this is going to be a season of Cersei. I mean, we've seen her mean before. Not mean. We've seen her, you know, kind of rule with a, an iron fist before. And I think that this is the season where she just is like, okay, I'm done with the bullshit. Like, yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to kind of step up. But, um... Oh, what was I going to say about, um, oh man, about Cersei? Oh yeah, one thing I read, um, I, I think it was io9, I don't remember exactly what it is, but uh, Blair posted it, um, about Brienne uh, basically being like the best character and, and it mm-hmm. possibly the show. Um, but one of the things they were talking about is how uh, female power and the female characters are a really, really big, important part of the season, which A, is awesome, and B, they were also talking about how... Um, in this episode, one thing that was just so intense was were the the little the little acting choices that were made that were the biggest ones the ones with the biggest impact. Yeah. Um, so with Brienne, like her facial expressions when she's you know pleading with Sansa, like I'm gonna try again. Right. That's, she had just the most amazing expressions there, and like they changed so drastically, but just with slight movements, and and there was so much communicated with just tiny facial movements and vocal choices and just the. The ladies on this show, man. The ladies on this show are oh. the reason this show, besides Davos, the reason this show is worth watching. And and I am floored by them every day. Like, I was floored by Danny in this episode. I was, like, floored by Sansa, Cersei, Arya. Except for Dornish women. <laughs> I really do we'll think. Talk about that. We will about We'll get to Dorn. Don't we'll you Dorn. worry we about a thing. Do. Um, so now let's move on to, speaking of Dorne, which, hmm, uh, we're gonna move on to our not-so-favorite moments, and this is just because, you know, they exist, they have to, we're critics, we have to be, it's the way, it's the name of the game. Um, so, for me, one of the, my, the moments that I just could not understand was Ramsey's uh, solo grieving scene, I just... I don't need that. I am so aware. I, Ramsey's a psychopath. Yes. He's a psychopath. We don't need to see him mourning some girl only to then have her body be thrown to the dogs anyway. It's pointless. It's stupid. It's not necessary. They keep That's, wasting time yeah. on Ramsey and this awful character when I really want to see Roos. Roos is the one that has all the power. We know Roos has all the power. And they keep trying to reinforce that Ramsey could be human on some level, and he's just not. He's not. And, and so I, it's yeah, frustrating. I think, right. I think they keep trying to, like, be like, no, but wait, maybe there's something, something like, good inside. No. no. And, like, you're right. It got so redundant. Like, I, as soon as he was talking to her, like, you know, and, and mourning, I'm doing finger quotes right now, like, mourning her. Yeah. I was like, he's going to throw her to the dogs. That's exactly. Of course. Like, he started the sentence with, like, you know, oh, she smelled a dog. I was like, oh, that's where her body's going. Yep. Mm-hmm. I don't know where she, she goes. Back, back to where she came from. Yeah. Back to where he came from. And it wasn't even a surprising, like, oh, he's so evil. It's no. like, no, we know he's evil. Like, that's probably the least evil thing he's done is throw somebody's body who he, you know, quote-unquote, not loved. Uh, yeah. 
appreciated. Oh, I guess. <laughs> used i don't know yeah i it's just it's really frustrating and that episode that scene was like seven minutes long or no i'm sorry it was like three minutes long then the roost stuff tacked on was seven minutes but it was just sort of redundant and ridiculous and i just it wasn't even redundant it's just that i don't need that we don't need that we know how evil he is we've already decided he's evil there's yeah. no reason for us to see. he didn't even cry like, yeah. no. all he said is he's gonna fucking, he, oh, freaking, he's gonna freaking hurt those people, and we already knew that. Exactly. We already knew that, and I, I do agree. I really wanted to see more of the Roost stuff, like, um, that little power play that happened between the two of them, where he's basically like, oh, well, like, we better hope that the baby coming out is a boy. Like, yeah, he's <laughs> like, mm-hmm, I have all the power in this. I play the game, kiddo. You don't. So good. He's like pouring like his wine just slowly. He reminds me so much of like a like a rich waspy like parent being like, "Oh well, uh, let's hope your brother gets into <laughs> you just got into Brown." Like mm. that's what they remind yes. me of. And you better go to Harvard because your older brother went to Yale and you need to one up. Like yeah. Yeah. Or I went to I went oh, to Harvard. So oh, if you got accepted into Brown. At least we had one. At least we had our other son. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm. Like, uh, he's just the worst. Just he's the just worst. the... I mean, no, he's not the worst, though. He's actually super interesting. He's the Red Wedding, you know? Roose Bolton is yeah. everything, and and I I love it. I love Roose, and I'm so ready for him to uh, peel Ramsey's skin off and wear it. Oh, yeah. Hopefully, literally. Hopefully, literally. So <laughs> that, that was my low light of the week. What about you? So, yeah, I had a few... I had... Yes. I had three. Okay. Two Jesus. Kind of, no, no. Well, I, I'm I'm just that kind of person. Um, two of them are more like just funny things I kind of noticed. The last one we will both segue into talking about. Yeah, but, we will. Um, one of them. This is like ridiculous, but I was really upset that Melisandre didn't bang John's dead body. I'm sorry. Like <laughs> I, I, I had called it a long time ago. I was like, I you do did. Not you said it immediately. <laughs> I, I. That is the first thing I was like. She got naked. I was like, oh my gosh, she's gonna do it. And then she did the last scene that I'm sure we'll talk about. But I was just like, <laughs> I talk about it right now. <laughs> yes, I wanted. I I wanted. I don't know. I don't know why. I wanted that little moment of satisfaction of like, oh, I'm right. She's really, really messed up. I she oh. wouldn't. I, I mean, she might go that far. You don't know. But now that we've seen her uh, true form, yeah. Who well, really knows? Honestly. I don't know. There's so many lies now. Everything's a lie. I'm trying to figure um, out what Melisandre has planned, and I and I I just don't, like what was the point of that scene? I well, oh yeah, okay. We talked about this a little bit. I what I got from that because I yeah I thought it was kind of weird too. Like it's weird that they named an entire episode after her, mm -hmm. and she's basically in two scenes very briefly. Like she's she's in the episode, but all she kind of says is like, "Oh, I was wrong." And then we yep. have this really weird scene at the end where, oh, like, she's old. and Shocker. Like, yeah, shocker. First of all, like, it, at first it was kind of like this came out of nowhere. I, I never suspected her mm -mm. or, you know, had any kind of theory. I was, I was totally taken aback by it. Totally. And, and like, to yeah, like, same here. Not even in a justify. I, I don't know. Just But but what I gathered from it is it was a, it was a visual metaphor of saying that maybe she's not quite as powerful as she mm -hmm. puts on a front as being... Wow, that was well, her, really badly worded. You get well, her only that. power comes from the stone around her neck. She's nothing. Yeah. She's nothing. Her power comes... She Her power comes from the Red God. Yeah. That's literally it. She's a pawn. She, I was just going to say, yeah. Which is crazy she's when you good. think about how much she treated Stannis as a pawn. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. But I think the thing... One thing they said, and as I, I watched the, um, like, Inside Game of Thrones thing after the episode, and... And they said that uh, she, they've been hinting at it for m years that she's old, and I'm like, w when? <laughs> Where's the proof? Where's the proof? <laughs> like, like, show me the proof. Show me the proof. I don't know. I, I, I hey, and if, if I'm wrong, I might be wrong. I probably am, but like honestly, this was so surprising to me to see her just like hunch over yeah. and deflate. You'd think she'd be proud that she's that yeah. freaking old. Yeah, yeah. And instead much. she's we, just, like, this cowering, like, tiny thing. And it's like, well, wait, that's not the Melisandre we know. I don't like that they're breaking her character. I mean, obviously she's broken because she screwed the pooch on everything. Yeah, um, but, I don't know, like, I guess she's getting her just desserts by seeing herself that way. 
because of what she did to Shireen and because of what she did to Stannis. And, but I, I don't know. I, I just sort of, it fell flat for me. That whole scene was yeah. just like, what? <laughs> it fell completely flat for me, too, just because, like, I was like, oh, that's a plot reveal I don't care about or character reveal, I guess. Like, I just didn't care. And if it, if they never mentioned it again, I would be like, yeah, that's fine. Like, yeah. let's move on and talk about other things. It just didn't do anything for me. No, nothing. I agree. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's another, what's another one of yours? Because that's oh, yeah. my second one anyway, so. Yes, I'm glad that uh, <laughs> talking about banging his dead, talking about necrophilia led into a very good discussion. It did. Mm. Uh, oh, good old good. necrophilia. It, it helps people. No. <clears throat> well, <laughs> Never mind. We can take that in a bunch of different ways. Weep, weep, weep. Stop talking, Sophia. <laughs> you could say it raises the dead. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, I just actually did the face palm. I did the Boromir face palm. Oh my god, Carly. <laughs> say that kind of thing. Mm, um, raise the dead. Moving on. Um, mm-hmm. my, I can't take credit for this one because my friend actually mentioned it yesterday. Okay. And I totally agree with it. I never thought of it like when I was watching it. He was like, did it bother you that um, when Jamie saw Cersei, he didn't, he didn't react to the fact that she has a boy cut now. <laughs> he did not even notice that her long blonde hair. Well, you are really, uh, you are really offended by the fact that they cut her hair off. I'm very upset. I really loved her hair so much. I just wanted to like make a big blanket of it, of it blanket of it. Oh well there. Just, yeah. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> this is getting weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> First, you're talking about necrophilia. Now you're talking about wanting to lie in a bed of Cersei's hair. Carly, have you had enough sleep? <laughs> You know, I think this is just my true form. This is my Melisandre moment. It's your Melisandre moment. Yeah. We all have them. It's okay. We all have them. I, ha- I had one last night. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I think that it's so traumatic, you know, the experience of uh, going in on a, docking on a boat that has your dead, your daughter's corpse. Oh, yeah. And, like, facing his, her, your sister slash the mother of your child. Oh, yeah, like, I think you past. sort of tend to look past the uh, <laughs> the aesthetics. I, I don't yeah, know. I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking too. But it was it was just a little funny to me that like this is a really big visual change and there's just no reaction to it. I mean, like I, my my whole thing is like he probably just figured like she's a strong and independent woman who can cut her hair if she wants. Well, but I bet she told him exactly like, what happened. Uh, I, I bet I bet she told him exactly how it happened. Oh, that's true. There was probably, yeah. There was they probably had a very long conversation about it. They and I don't did. know if they did it. We're not sure. They didn't seem to be doing it, so. A lot of things happen off camera, I guess. I, yeah, you know, you <laughs> never know what happens in under Lannister sheets. You just oh, don't, God. You just don't know. <laughs> sheets of golden hair. Mm. <laughs> hair. Mm. Okay. Yoda, uh, excuse boys. me. <laughs> Yoda yes. just came out to play. Okay, uh... <laughs> So, so um, next up, let's, you know, because we were talking about Cersei, let's just move right on into the theory of the week, which we had last season as well, but it's not going to be as long and drawn out. It's just going to be a pretty, 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 pretty short one. Um, so we're talking about Cersei and I, I love Cersei. I do. I, she, 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 I, I don't know if it's my love of Lena Headey. I don't know if it's my love of strong women, but she just, man, she rocks my socks off. She's awesome. Um, but there is a theory that says that she will actually be murdered by her own son. And this is playing on the uh, prophecy that Maggie the Frog tells Cersei when Cersei is very young and goes to talk to her. And they show that in the beginning of season five, I believe. Yeah, super um, happy that came back this season in this moment. Hmm? I'm really happy they brought that back. Well, I mean, they, I don't know. If, I don't know if they're gonna bring it back. We're gonna see more uh, flashbacks, but I don't know if we're gonna see it from uh, Brand's green site or what, or if it's gonna be memories. Um, so obviously, uh, Maggie the Frog predicted that she would be a queen until another younger, more beautiful came and comes to wreck everything and ruin mm-hmm. her life. Uh, but she also makes a very uh, stirring sort of chill, like, goose pimply prediction that describes Cersei's death. And what she says is, And when your tears have drowned you, the Valonqar shall wrap his hands about your pale white throat and choke the life from you. Which is really freaking terrifying, because Valonqar is actually Valyrian 
um, for little brother. So uh, obviously people think that it's Tyrion that's going to be killing Cersei, but if you actually look very specifically into the wording of Maggie's prophecy, she says the Valonqar, not your Valonqar. I, w- I will also say, I didn't think about this until right now, if Tommen... Okay, Tom- <laughs> is Tommen the product... Is he a Barabian or is no, he... No, he's incestual. He's a product he's of incestual. incest. Yeah, so yeah. And technically, technically... No, don't say it. Is he not technically their sibling? Ew. <laughs> no, they would be. He would be her nephew, but also her kid, because they're siblings. True, but like, if you combine the DNA and it's just Lannister DNA again, I think it's kind of like. I mean, it's incest. Yeah, There's no well, rhyme or reason to incest. <laughs> Lancers. I mean, it's incest. That should be the tagline of this. I mean, <laughs> this season on this season on you got got. It's just incest. <laughs> it's in, I don't know. Um, but anyway, the the theory is that instead of she, Maggie the Frog doesn't say your your Valonqar. She says the Valonqar, and the Valonqar means the little brother. And there is only one little brother, and that is Tommen. So who knows? Maybe Tommen's gonna be murdering Cersei for uh, Marjorie. Yeah, and I, I was actually just gonna say, like, they've been they've been building on that slowly but surely. Um, cause I mean you you have you have Marjorie pulling this pulling the Tom and strings yep. in her direction, obviously. You have Cersei as a protective mother, but also as, you know, someone who wants to uh not see Marjorie in power. Right, exactly. Um, and so we've we've been able to see the show build up this kind of this kind of tension. Um, and I mean, Tommen does love Marjorie, and I do feel like Marjorie is working her magic on him. Uh, well, right now the Sparrow's so working his, the Sparrow's working his magic on Marjorie to ensure yeah. that he can get Tommen on his side. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, you get a lot of forces working you do. Um, against... Tommen, his, Tommen could totally be tricked into killing his mom. Oh, 100%. 100%. I have no doubt for a second yeah. that he is totally swayable. Yep. One hundred percent. Okay, so uh, let's now talk. This is a new a new section. Ooh, Ooh. Uh, it is called Sophia's therapy session. We figured we can uh, use Carly's psychology knowledge yes. and my uh, PTSD from the books to uh, show c- disaster. Yes, um, as the DSM states. We're, yes, we're going to be talking about one issue that I had. <laughs> In terms of books versus the show. Just one. Nothing crazy. I'm going to try and tone down my, my my speaking toward the books because they're totally different and I have to understand that. But we're going to slowly work toward that. So I get yes. to ta- I get to gripe about one thing a week. I like it. Yes. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. But first, I would just like to take a moment of, sil- of silence for uh, the dearly departed Stannis Baratheon. <laughs> who was confirmed dead in the in the Red Woman by Bruce Bolton? So let's just uh, take a moment here. Moment silence. Okay, that was that was really nice. That was really nice. I got to think about my uh, my favorite moments with Stannis, which weren't in the show. So mm. little okay. montage in your just mind. Just a little montage. I just got to. I just saw his fleeting his eyes, oh. just like staring at me through the flames. Salt and pepper. He was like, Salt "It's okay." He told me, "It's okay, Sophia. You're you're gonna be fine." <laughs> okay, so uh, so my gripe, uh, which is, I, I don't even know if you're going to be able to help me out with this, with this one, Carly, because you and I are both in the same boat, um, but god dang Dorn. <laughs> oh, god. Okay. I, I don't know what they're trying to accomplish with Dorn. Uh, this, this might be one of those times where the psychologist needs a psychologist, because <laughs> Dorn has, oh my god, okay, you go first, because this is, this is your time. This um, is your therapy session. It's... I just don't even know where to begin because, you know, the moment I saw Dorn in the opening, uh, in the dun, 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 you know, in the theme song, I was just yeah. like, gosh darn it. And I saw their names. And so I knew that they were going to be, I knew that Indira, Indira Sharma was going to be in the episode. I knew that the Sand Snakes were going to be in the episode. And I was just like, maybe, maybe they learned from their mistakes. That's all I asked of them. This was to not kill off Davos and to learn from their mistakes. And instead yeah. they have completely ruined any, of the goodness that was left in Dorne by straight up murdering Ario Hota, Duran Martell, and Tristan Martell. My mind, I mean, 
It was the last time I tweeted during the uh, during the premiere, and all I said was in all caps, "What the heck? What the heck is happening?" <laughs> like, I, and, and, like with three exclamation points after the end of each one. That's an appropriate reaction. I just can't believe that anyone would ever think of putting Ilaria Sand in charge. Like, it just it blows my mind because she is so the worst revenge driven. I mean, she's oh god, it's like they put Lady Stoneheart but a bad version into the real version of Ilaria Sand. And I don't know how, if that makes sense to anybody, but like, it, it just, it really, it really feels that way. It just feels that they are reaching. And how does that, how does that make you feel? Oh, I feel great about it. <laughs> it's the favorite part of the show. It's my, oh. I love it so much. I love hatred. I love it. I love, I hatred. love feeling my anguish favorite. and pain. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's, un- it's, Unfortunate because last season they just kind of screwed Dorn up. They they did not. Huh, it was they just it was bad. It was so bad. And I have my spear. Uh, oh God! It, it, that's it what just, it felt like. And then in this season, it it was just a huge cop out. Yeah. It was like let's wipe out everyone who is actually worth caring about in Dorn and just keep the characters we literally despise. Could not care less about. We, we despise hate them so much. We hate them so much. I don't ever want to see them again. They have no significance in my mind as characters who have any any plot purpose. Know. And now we're going to see them probably in every episode. Great. I'm so excited. I'm so looking forward to it. Ah, yay, every episode. Let's just, you know what? Let's end Let's end the rest of this show and let's just watch Dorn. Let's you know, just, I a think. Game of Dorn. A Game of Dorn. Game of Dorn. It, it'll be the spinoff of Game of Thrones. The more popular, better like, awarded spinoff. Yes. Yes. On the CW. On the CW. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm just really frustrated because we know that revenge-driven characters wind up in the mud, and it's frustrating. It just seemed lackluster. I was... Yeah. It, it was shocking, but it wasn't shocking. Like, Duran did not deserve that death. No. Duran is a very, very cool character, and they gave him no chance whatsoever, and they traded him out for a character that is so boring. Oh. And then they killed Ariel Hota, who, um, I'm sorry, stabbed in the back. Are you serious? He totally would have survived that. Oh, yeah. Would have survived it, and all the deaths were just, like, kind of kind of a coward. Like, the way that they were killed was how a coward stabbed would Stabbed in the back. Like, stabbed Tristane back. was stabbed through the head from the back. So Ario not- Hoto was stabbed in the back. Duran Martel was stabbed right in the, in the, in the, in the heart. But still, like... But he was in a chair. In he a chair, and he's weak. Up, like- he doesn't have, um, his legs barely work. Right. So he, like, he, ah, he's a cripple, <laughs> essentially. And they oh. freaking attacked them, and it just blows my mind. It's insane. It, it, absolutely makes no sense and it's it's upsetting because i really would have liked to see how um the oh uh, what's the prince's name Dur- uh tristane tristane i really would, would have liked to see how he reacted to marcella's death i really yeah. i really would have liked to see um you know where where he took his power he, he I knew really i mean he knew because it happened on the boat that he was on oh god i forgot about that but That's... they we just never got to see his reaction from it well exactly and i mean he, that could have turned into an interesting plot line in its, in its own right yep, I mean, absolutely he, his reaction to it and, you know, and what he was going to do from there is kind of a rising, uh, you know, future kingly figure. And yep. they just waste, it was a big waste. It was yep. a big waste of what could have been really cool. Absolutely. So, okay, we're both on the same page. Dorn right. sucks. Yeah. Dorn sucks. <laughs> That's all we have to say. My, my diagnosis is that it just straight up sucks. Dorn yeah. is the worst. Dorn is the worst. Dorn is the worst. I prescribe, um literally watching any other moment of the episode yes i agree so let's move on to something more positive let's talk about uh your segment my dear do you want to explain it i uh do yes um we're still working it out (laughs) (laughs) of course as we do it's a work in progress we're gonna call this segment a work in progress there we go yes and uh but basically what we do is um it's a it's a blank of the week kind of thing and so this week it's badass moment of the week Mm -hmm. um which will have a better name someday, but work in progress. Um, and this this week, I think I don't think there's any argument that the baddest moment of the week was Brienne. Absolutely, yeah, hands just, down, was, best moment of the week. Oh my gosh, so Brienne good. taking them out. Mm. Oh yeah, and it was one of the few times where I was very okay with like 
you know, coming in the nick of time and like just you know just getting there right before they take them back yep. to you know the hellhole they came from. Um, it, it didn't seem like cheesy. It didn't seem hokey. It seemed like no, she's on. She knows what she's doing. She's probably been following them. She exactly. knows where they've been going. Like she knows what she's doing. So it was just it was such an awesome and like well deserved Brienne moment. It, I remember we were all chanting her name. Oh yeah. Like when they all surrounded Sansa and Theon, we were like Brienne. Brienne, yeah. Bri- and then we yeah. heard the horse whinny, and we all just lost our, like, marbles. Oh, <laughs> we God. all went insane, no. and there she comes riding. God, she's so cool. She she's is the so perfect, cool. just, oh, she's amazing. She's amazing. I mean, she's she's awesome, and I, I feel like this episode may have been the episode that if people weren't Brienne fans, or if yes. they liked her but, like, didn't really feel either way about her yep i feel like this is the episode that kind of was like okay she's awesome like yep. this is who we want to follow no, um, I, I mean halfway through season five i fell in love with her it took me a really long time i yeah. thought she was a little ridiculous but now nothing about her seems like that way to me she is just she is incredible she yeah. is everything this that this show needs and if she weren't in it it would just be so slow I agree. And I mean, she, to me, is the most, um, because one of the kind of qualms I had about this episode is that it felt more, it felt less like the adaptation that it's supposed to be. And Mm -hmm. it felt more like a TV show. Yes. Which I don't like. It took away something special a little bit. And I don't really know what that is. And it was just the first episode. So, you know, but the Brienne moment was a very, it just felt very Game of Thrones. It felt like, yes, this is from the world that I fell in love with that I continued watching the show for. And Exactly. Yeah. It was so perfect. It was, I, I 100% agree, there is hands down no other moment that even comes close to being as badass as that. Mm-hmm. At all. Like, she's, okay. she, Brienne, has absolutely taken the cake for the best, I, I'm honestly one of the best characters in the show. Because yeah. she's not afraid, and she's wounded, and she's battle-born, or battle, I don't even know what I'm saying. She's just wonderful. <laughs> like, I get so caught up in thinking about her. She's so cool. She is so cool and, like, has been through so much. And I feel like she said to prove her th- herself throughout the entire show, not only to the other characters, but she has finally, like, she has proven herself to us. And yep. we are, we're on the same page. We're on the we're on Team Brienne now. We are. I think everybody's on Team Brienne. If you don't like listen. Brienne, who are you? And what has she not done to, t- to make you like her? Seriously. I, she shouldn't even have to try. You no, know, she shouldn't because she's awesome. I mean, the, the people who don't like Brienne are probably the same people who like Dorne. So. Ah, uh. That's what I would think. Mm-mm. No, no, no. Shame on you. Shame. 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 Ugh, hey. no. I never, if I hear that ever, if I see that Septa one more time, I'm gonna... Ugh. She's the worst. Septa She's Unella. I, I'm, I'm glad that the High Sparrow was like, yeah, she kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll talk to her about it. <laughs> <laughs> She's the worst. That actually seemed like classic manipulation, though. Um, yeah, oh, definitely. Good cop, bad cop. Yeah. Oh, definitely. But I, I'm so glad he said it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, badass moment of the week. I total complete agreement on both sides. Let's move on to my my badass, my 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 love. Let's talk. Let's let's do Davos talk. Let's just let's get right into the nitty gritty and talk about Davos for let's you know half an hour. Because I would. And the next episode will be dedicated purely to Davos. <laughs> That's it. The Onion Knight of my heart. He gets everything. Um, no, but for real, if we're being completely honest, like, I could not be happier and more terrified to see him front and center. Um, I, I, I know, like, he, I think he had the most screen time in this episode, if we're really thinking about it. He's in it so much. He's in two scenes where, and then, and that was more than most other characters were in. I think he was in um, more than that, actually. Three, maybe? I think he was in three. Yeah. At least, yeah. Oh, you're right. He is in three. He's in the beginning, middle, and the end. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm so excited. Uh, I loved the mutton, him talking to Alizar Thorne and, and being like, I want mutton. Oh, it's so good. And then knowing that he's, he's clever in a way that isn't clever. I don't know how to say it. He, he doesn't t- think of himself as knowledgeable or clever or good in any way, but yet he's a smuggler. Like, you have to remember that this guy, and this is what I'm going to get into in our, in our next segment, um, is actually very well seasoned in this type of thing. And he says it. He's like, in the, uh, he goes, I've been running from men like that, talking about Alistair Thorne, all my life. And yeah. I think we're going to finally get to know you guys 
you who have not read the books or who have read the, the books but always sort of got bored during Davos scenes, like, you are going to understand why this guy is so important. And oh, I... Oh, God. I'm so nervous. Kyle, uh, Kyle Tremblay was asking me, he was like, do you think that... I think he's going to die this season, do you? And I, and I wholeheartedly, 100% believe that they are going to keep... If anybody's going to survive this, it's going to be Davos. I think so, too. I'm, I'm not nervous for him, which actually makes me nervous, but I'm right. not nervous for him. Um, and, and anyone can die. We know that. But in my heart right now, I believe that he won't die. I like that, and I hope that that is true. Um, me too. I, I mean, I, what, one thing I think he has that a lot of people don't have who are in power in the show or who are just in the show in general, he has that sense of, like, I don't know if humility is the right word. Yeah. Is it the right word? Like... Because he's, you know, he's seen stuff. He's kind of seen the real world. Not that, you know, anybody at Castle Black hasn't. Like, you know, obviously they're living in some of the harshest conditions yeah. that exist on, in this world. But, and they've, they've seen, you know, they've seen struggle. They've seen yeah. war. Like, they've seen a lot. But he he comes at everything. Um, and he, he did this for Stannis, too. Like, Stannis was very, he was so under the Red Woman's control. And Davos mm-hmm. was always that anchor bringing him back down to earth. And I think that that's Davos' best, uh, biggest strength is that he is that kind of, like, down to earth, just kind of real person yeah. who's like, no, I've, I've, I've been around the block. Like, I've seen. Yeah. And he's like, never, he never tries to take control. He no. just talks. He's not, he doesn't want to be in control. That's not what he wants. Like, even right. when he's talking to the Brothers of the Night's Watch, he's like, you can leave. But just know that I think that these guys are untrustworthy. And I've, I mean, I've been around the block. Like, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm really, God, I just love him. He's <laughs> and I, I'm so excited for this season. It really set up, for one thing, it really set up Davos' story. And oh. in the trailer, we saw that he's going to be going to House Mormont at some point, and he's going to be talking to Lyanna, who I believe is 12 years old. So we're going to see him with another young girl oh. at some point in this. And oh, I don't know if my heart's going to be able to handle it, to be honest. <laughs> uh, if he gives her, like, a baby, a little, like, wooden toy deer. Like a bear. Whatever it was that he gave... <sighs> I can't. Yeah, I know. It would be so much. Um, but yeah, that, just Davos. I, I, it, that was sort of like, I, not, it's nothing I've never said before about Davos, but <laughs> I, I really do believe that he is a major player this season. And keep your eye on him. That's all I have to say. Keep your eye on Liam Cunningham. Keep your eye on Davos. He knows what he's doing. He has a plan. He's got it. He's got it. He's got um, it. And now to even more reinforce my love of Davos. We're going to talk about a new, this is a new segment, um, it's called the History of Westeros. I'm just going to throw tiny, interesting tidbits of information at you guys about the history of Westeros and sort of what went down in, um, you know, Robert's Rebellion, even earlier than that, in the fall of Valyria, all that kind of stuff. I just think that it's so interesting and it's so steeped in history Westeros is that, you know, it's cool to know little things. And because Davos was so front and center in this episode, I wanted to sort of tell a story about Davos. Um, but it's also about Stannis. So, uh, Carly, are you, are you ready for this? I, yes, okay. do it. I'm ready to learn. Are you ready? To, okay, so um, back in during Robert's Rebellion, which was Robert versus um, Mad Eris, the king, he wanted to usurp him, uh, Mace Tyrell was allied with uh, Mad King, and it was Stannis Baratheon was with Robert and, and Ned and all those people. Um, so... Uh, Mace Tyrell descended on Storm's End, which is obviously, we've been there multiple times. It's Stannis' house, uh, Stannis' place of living. Um, and they they sieged uh, Storm's End for a year, for a better part of a year. And Storm's End has never, ever fallen, to this day, has never fallen to siege because of the way it's set, situated. And But the problem was that they were running out of food. And so somehow... Um, a smuggler slipped through uh, red, the red wine fleet of the Arbor, which is Mace Tyrell's, uh, uh, or sorry, Ma- uh, Paxter Redwine's dude. I don't know. There are a lot of names in this that don't really matter to other people, but they matter to me. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he slipped through the fleet and entered Storm's End uh, with onions and salt fish enough to give the starving garrison what they needed to fight back until Ned Stark arrived to save them. So essentially, Davos saved, and it, this is how he got knighted, and this is why he is the Hand of the King. It's because he just took it upon himself to go and take them onions, and that's why he's called the Onion Knight as well. 
So just a little, it's not, I mean, I, I just love it because it he was the reason that they survived that. That's awesome. Let, I me, know. let me just pick up this knowledge you just dropped on everybody. Uh-huh. Mm. What are you going to do with it, Carly? Oh my God. So many things. There's <laughs> so many things I could do with it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't know what to do with it. It's, I, it's, it's layered like an onion. It, it is. Uh, don't make. That's a Shrek reference, dude. It like, is. That is a Shrek reference. Don't, don't bring Shrek into Davos. Like, what are you doing? No, I know they Shrek both talk about not, onions, but come on. Oh, my God. That is, that is very cool. And I think that's my favorite piece of, of what, like, history from Game of Thrones that you have told me because you, you are like a walking encyclopedia for this stuff now. And I. <laughs> Anytime, like, I'm always like, tell me a story about Westeros, like, just, like, hands on my chin, like. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's just, like, Davos is so important. It, the siege, so when they sieged, it continued for a year, and the garrison, like, had to resort to eating their horses and dogs and cats and almost had to eat each other, like, their own dead. Like, it was crazy. While Mace and uh, Paxer Redwine and Mathis Rowan all feasted, right outside of the castle walls and, like, made fun of them. And so Davos showing up in the nick of time with his, you know, that was, like, a really big deal, and it's no one ever talks about it. Gee, they really should have that in the show because, like, I, one of the things that I've learned from you throughout, you know, last season and this season so far is how important Davos is because <laughs> I did not know before. I was just like, he's a cute old man. I wish he was my grandpa. In case you were wondering, I almost named this podcast Davos Talk. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was going to be literally all about him, and then I decided against it. But that is that is my little tidbit, uh, History of Westeros. Next week, we might be talking about the Doom of Valyria. Who knows? Because we can talk about Jorah. We didn't talk about... Uh, Jorah was in this episode, and he found Khaleesi's ring, and that's really all we need to know about that. Tyrion was in it, too, and they talked. Yeah. They were talking. Tyrion often does. With Varys. They were talking, and then their ships got burned. And that's it. But I don't think they were planning on going back to Westeros anyway, so I, I'm confused by that. Um, but now, I, I think that's really all to cover in the episode, right? I think, I think, we, I think we did a pretty good job with that. I think we did, too. That, it was a very, very dip-the-toe-in kind of episode. It was. This, this episode set up a lot of what is going on this season, and it kind of acted as a good bridge from the insanity that was last season yep. and the end of it and, and getting us into season uh Season six. So. I, I think so too. I think I know it, they told us everything we need to know about every character that we care about. We know where everybody is sort of headed, and we're sort of we're a little bit more prepared. We're not going to be thrown in completely blind into this next episode. Yes. Where we're going to see Bran. I'm so excited. Like where Bran is coming back in the next yes. episode. My baby, my angel, my little angel. Like Bran is coming back, and I'm so excited. And and uh, yeah, but let's let's uh, let's finish it out by giving this um, uh, the red woman a, a beard rating. Oh, man. Ooh, because that's not going away. So, Carly, of all the beards in Westeros, what does the Red Woman equate to? Oh, man. Ah. (laughs) That's a good... I, you know, okay, I think I'm going to have to give it to Davos' beard because Mm. this episode was so Davos-centric. Interesting. That is a fair... See, I've always held Davos' beard in the highest regard, so that's that's different from what you said last night about this episode but well, i'm no, down well, with it i'm 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 only giving it to the i'm only giving it a davos beard because of all the davos, davos. yeah because so <laughs> he was like in it so it. much yes i in this okay for this episode i think i would probably give it um a, a jora yeah something like a little there but not really catchy there. yeah kind of sandy looking but trustworthy and stalwart but yeah, yeah. I mean, trustworthy but also kind of there's a disease underneath so <laughs> And that's, um, I, I decided to give it to, um, the Colin Morrow's Donald Glover lookalike Blood Rider. Oh my god. That is, that, that is who the beard rating I'm giving it. Um, it was exactly what it needed to be, but with a little cleverness thrown in as well, a little bit light of lighthearted, sort of jokey type nonsense. And I don't know, I, I really, overall, I thought this episode did exactly what it needed to do. It wasn't crazy. Nothing really happened except the murder of all the freaking Martells. That happened. Um, they all just, you know, got murdered. Uh, but overall, like, I, I it, it does, it's no Blackwater, it's no Watchers on the Wall, but yeah. it's no, also, also no Unbad, Unbad, Unbroken. 
It's a it's a bridge. It's a bridge episode. It's a bridge episode. I'm excited to see what it's leading us to. I'm, I'm not so much excited. I wasn't super stoked about this episode. I'm just stoked that Game of Thrones is back and we have something exactly. to do with our lives again. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, Carly, uh, tell our dear sweet listeners how they can find you. Yes, okay. As always, you can find me on Twitter um, at Chillin555, which is C H I L L Y N 555. Um, I am also on medium.com at uh, hi, yes, hello. And if you want to find me a much easier way, just go to threadless.com. Um, I'm the blogger for Threadless. I'm the content manager and writer. So just go to Threadless, go to our blog. I write about a lot of cool, geeky things and fun, artsy things. So um, my name is there and some links. Yay! Yeah. And, and as always, you can find me at Sophia M. Porter on Twitter. And you can also follow the podcast at You Got Got Pod. Uh, if you guys have any questions, tweet at us. If you liked the episode, if you didn't like the episode, let us know. Because we want to know, obviously. Like, we care what you think. So uh, thank you all so much for listening. And remember, the night is dark. But full of Davos.